in nothing are we to become discouraged. We're just, we're to preach the word in season, out of season. Right now it's in season. So let's, um, let's have a word of prayer and then, and then we'll get started. Our gracious Father in heaven, Father, we want to thank you and praise you that we can come into your presence, coming boldly to the throne of grace because you have promised, because you have invited us to come there. Father, we are before you now by faith. And Father, as with living faith that comes by your word, we ask that your word would be spoken here today. Father, that every meeting would be according to the anointing which you give by your Holy Spirit, your spirit of truth. And Father, that you will edify the body. Father, that the blessing of the latter rain would be poured out. You've invited us to ask for the latter rain, and Father, we're asking that you will come to us as the rain. Father, thank you so much for the gift of your Spirit. So, thank you so much for your exceedingly great and precious promises, that your word is truth, and Father, it has sanctifying power. And Father, as we look into the power of your word and the revelation of your Son, I'm praying, Father, that we will go away beholding a glimpse of the glory of your your Son, your Word, and we thank you and we praise you, Father, for being here with us. And Father, we also want to just ask that you might fill this room, Father, that for all these meetings that are of, time, of timely importance, Father, that you will bring people to hear these messages. However you want to do it, Father, we just ask that they would be brought, and Father, that the invitation will still be given even during the feast. We thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer. In the name of your Holy Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're in the Feast of Tabernacles. Praise, praise Father for that. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is something I believe is um, most essential knowledge that we can obtain in, in salvation, in our walk with our Heavenly Father. And so, because of that, I want us to look at something about uh, a study that's really dear to my heart. It's something that we all need, and I'm going to go from the scriptures, and we're going to see why we need it. So, let's go to 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we're going to start there. 2 Corinthians 3.18. We're going to look at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation 3.18, or no, 2 Corinthians, rather, 3.18, and it says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This text is going to be the opening text that I'm going to open with because it's the most essential knowledge that we can receive. It is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we know Him, we will become changed. If we behold Him, if we see Him as He truly is, then we will go from glory to glory and we're going to reveal the character of our God. But... A lot of people are manifesting no more power. They're not revealing any more glory than if they weren't beholding Him at all. They're getting into the Bible. They're, they're reading many different things. But there's something that seems to be going on. And there's no power being witnessed in their experience. And so I want to look at why that is. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. And we're going to really put the the pinpoint on why this is happening. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And we'll, let's start at verse 3. It says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, notice that it's by beholding that we become changed. But, if, your go if the gospel is hid, 
then you can't see or you can't behold anything at all. And so that means that you won't be changed from glory to glory. And what is Satan's aim? He wants to blind your mind. And what does he want to do? He wants to lead you into unbelief. That is the key thing. It says that he blinds the minds of them that believe not. Now, there are many people who profess to believe, but again, because they don't truly believe when their faith is tried, they manifest nothing more than an experience of somebody out in the world. But I think that that needs to change because I think that our Father has something a little more for us than what a lot of us are taking hold of. Let's go to first, uh, Romans chapter 1. We're going to go to verse 16. And now it says, if our gospel be hidden, that's what I want us to focus on for a moment. If our gospel be hidden, and we're going to look at what the gospel is and what the scriptures declare it to be. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, if the gospel is the power of God unto everyone that believes, what happens if you are in unbelief? You have no power. No power unto salvation. No power unto salvation means no salvation at all. No power at all means you cannot behold, you cannot reflect the glory of God. You're not actually seeing the righteousness of God in the gospel. Because without faith, you cannot see who God truly is. You cannot actually have a living experience with Him. So there's immediately a detachment if we are unbelieving and if we're not beholding the glory of Christ. So that is the thrust of what I'm going to be presenting over the, the course of the messages which I'll be giving. The revelation of Jesus Christ so that we may behold His glory and become changed in the same image and be inspired to a living faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 10 and look at how we receive faith. Romans chapter 10. And so, over the course of the, the meetings that I'm going to be doing, we're going to go over the verses again and again and again and again. And we're going to see that the verses, not only do they have things old and new for us, but also we're going to go over them because these things we need to know for ourselves. And we can't exhaust going over these things again and again and again because it lays a foundation for us and it lays a framework for our experience. We can't exhaust the Word of God and we can't know it too much. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verses 11, and then we're going to jump to 13 and 14. Now it says this, it says, For the Scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed shall not be ashamed. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, I'm only a sinner. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm only human. So they walk in this experience and they, they're continually walking in guilt. They don't know anything but shame and they don't understand this principle that whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. And if not ashamed, that means not at all. It means there's no shame at all. That means even of the gospel. Our lives are to even be a testament, a witness to the power of that very gospel. And we're going to see how the gospel comes, how faith in the gospel comes, so that we can have power for ourselves. In verse 13 and verse 14, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Let's, let's just keep reading. Verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But if goodness is to be embodied in anything at all, it, it is the gospel, it's the glad tidings. If the goodness of anything is to be revealed from God, we're going to have to know the gospel. And 
above all, we're going to have to know who Christ is. Now, we need to believe on Him, but if we don't know about Him, if we're not studying the Word to get to know Him, then all of our searching is really empty. We're not really attaining a true knowledge of Christ who reveals to us the Father. When we see Him, we see the Father. And without Him, we won't see the Father at all. And that's the only way that we'll reveal the image of God. Now, look at the sum of the matter in verse 17. It says this, So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. Now, that is where faith comes in. That's where belief comes in. And that's the only way we can believe in the gospel is by faith. But faith only comes by the Word. However, I believe a lot of people have detached the Word from the source of power, from the source of strength. And we read it as ink on a page. But the Word goes deeper than that. The very hearing that we have, it says it comes by the Word of God. It is created by the Word of God. And without that, we couldn't hear anything at all. Now let's go, and we're going to look at the identity of what it means to have that faith. What it means to actually have faith by that Word. Let's look at the Word and the identity of that Word. John chapter 1. Let's turn to John chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 to 3. And here is set forth some very important words, vital, that we understand so that a foundation can be laid. And in understanding these words, I believe that a true knowledge, a true foundation can be laid to go on and learn more things about who our Savior is, what salvation is, and what the gospel is. In 1, verses 1 to 3, John starts out his gospel this way. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, it says, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So here is set forth the identity of Christ. He is called the Word. He Himself is that Word which gives us faith. And if He is the Word that gives us faith, then He is that Word by which the power should come. Does that make sense? Yeah? There is no power without Christ. There is no power unto salvation, and there is no salvation at all without Christ. His name is Yeshua. That means salvation in Hebrew. Now, looking at that Word, let's look a little bit deeper at what the Word Himself does. Because it says all things were made by him, what does that take in? Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Now, it is obviously evident that if all things were made by him, then it excludes nothing at all. So that means that if all things are made by him, then nothing is left outside of that. But just to get a more grounding in the scriptures and to see what it says, to see the means by which God created all things. It speaks of Christ in Colossians 1, verse 16. Is everyone there? Amen. Amen. It says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Now, Let's read verse 17 as well. It says, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Amen. Now, speaking of Christ, all things were made by Him. Everything that we see, everything that the eye looks upon. There is not anything as we look upon things that the Word hasn't made. So already, that's going to establish a bit of a foundation. That Christ Himself is upholding something. He's upholding every single thing, every atom, every, every universe, every planet is being upheld by His power. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, and we'll go to verses 2 and 3.
Hebrews 1, verse 2 and 3. Maybe we'll start at verse 1. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, keep in mind that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. It says, God, who at sundry times in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. It's interesting who's speaking, who's speaking through the prophets. It's, it's God. But who is God? Well, let's read verse 2. It says, Has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son? Okay, so we know who spoke through the prophets. It was the Father. So, who is the Son, though? That's the focus that we want to, we want to behold. It says, Whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom he has also made the worlds. It's interesting that God did create all things, and he created all things by that word, and that word has all power to do exactly what it says it will do, and that it was by that word that the Father made all things. So there's an intimate connection between God and Christ that is inseparable, and it's only by that word that we're going to have that connection with our Father. It's that on, that's the only possible way that we're ever going to be restored into the image of God. Now, verse 3, it says that he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, if it says that he's upholding all things and he created all things, does that mean all things? Yeah? So he's upholding all things. Now, I want to I challenge you. If he's upholding all things, now, I believe that there's freedom of choice, so that doesn't mean that people have to choose to keep his way. But I want to ask you, if he's upholding all things by the word of his power, does that mean that he's, he's holding up these planets? Yeah? Yeah? He's keeping everything in its course. He's keeping the sun going around the earth. He's, he's doing all these things. Yeah? Okay. Now, what about us? Is he keeping our heart beating? Yeah? Yeah? He's keeping us breathing. He's keeping us alive. Keeping us thinking. Keeping our body functioning. Yeah. All things. He's upholding all things by the word of his power. And that excludes nothing. So he is permi he's even permitting, he's upholding man in himself to make choices for life or for death. To choose the word or to not choose the word. Now, where was the source of Eve's fall? Can you think? Where was the source of Eve's fall? When you think of Eve when she fell, it was by the tempter, the serpent, right? Lack of trust. It was lack of trust. It was unbelief. That's right. By belief in God's word, there's a connection. There's power. But when you do not believe God's word, it leaves you vulnerable. It leaves you unguarded. It leaves you without power. And what ended up happening? She did no longer see who God truly was. She no longer trusted that God's word could be true. And because she could not trust, that in itself left her open for the fall. Had she kept the word of God, she would have experienced the power of the word of God and she would never have fell because in keeping the word of God, you will experience the fact that he upholds even you by that power which is found in his word. Now let's look at a little bit about the, the power of the word. Let's go to Genesis 1, verse 3. Genesis 1, verse 3. And that word is Christ. So every time we see anything about the word at all, that must necessarily mean it is fundamentally, uh, inextricably bound to the fact that everything that's spoken about the word is speaking about Christ. And if you speak about anything else, if you just speak about the ink on paper, that's not good enough. Anything detached from Christ will never be what God has purposed for it to be. Genesis 1, verse 3, and it says about God's word, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now he speaks a word, and it comes to pass. He says something and it happens. That, that in itself should encourage every single one of us to get into our Bibles. There's no excuse not to get into our word. Let there be light and there's light. 
Well, if we want light in God's word, if we want to behold his glory, we need light, right? And it says the entrance of your word gives light, but if we're not reading the word, if we're not believing the word, we're not going to have anything more than what we already have. In fact, we might decline from what we already have because we're not doing anything with what we have been given. Let's go to Isaiah 55, verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Open right to it, probably. So Way ahead of you all. Is it the father thinking and the son speaking? Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I believe so. Right. There's a, there's a, there's a channel connection. Let, I, maybe I'll get into a verse that will we'll say that right after. Okay? But yeah, it was the Father, and then the, when you look at the Word of God, it says in the Scriptures, by the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What verse is that? What's that? What verse is that? Which one? Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 11. Now, it says, by the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, if God's word is, is Christ, then it must necessarily be evident to us all that Christ is the heart of God revealed. And he is also the executor of God's purposes. Let's take a look. Isaiah 55, verse 11. <clears throat> it says this about the word, which is Christ. <clears throat> it says, so shall my word be, that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Now, when we consider Christ, and we consider that that word must necessarily be speaking of Christ, then we see that he is the executor of God's will, of God's purposes, of God's plan, and that includes the gospel. And the gospel only comes by the word, and it, of course it's revealed by the things that are made. But we get a distinct knowledge of God through the word. But that word is Christ. Now it says that his word will not return to him void. It shall have an effect. It shall do something for us that we need to most have done for us. The thing which we cannot do for ourselves is the very thing that God's word can do alone for us then therefore we need to trust, not be like Eve and not spiritualize away the word of God, not believe it, when it says have no un fruit, unfellow, not have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It means it. We're not to have fellowship with darkness, we're to have fellowship with light. We're to be in the light, we're called to be sons of light. Now looking at this, it says that the word always does the thing it always accomplishes the thing which pleases God. And Christ says just the same thing. Let's go to John 8, 29. John 8, 29. Speaking of his identity as the word. Speaking of his identity as that word. It says... Verse 29, did I say 39 or 29? Yeah, 29. And it says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. And why? For I do always those things that please him. Now, the word shall prosper whereunto it's sent. It shall do that thing which it's sent to do. And it will always do the thing which pleases God. Now, what about our testimony, though? If God upholds us by the word of his power, then shouldn't, if that word is dwelling in us, and if that word is upholding us, shouldn't that be our testimony? Just a thought. Let's go to Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13. And I believe that that is to be our testimony. Philippians 2.13, and everybody is there. Okay, I want to encourage everybody to actually open their Bibles too, just, just because it's really important. I, what you'll notice is that when you open your Bible and you actually get into the Word, 
that there is, it's a really powerful experience, especially when you realize that this is the voice of God to your soul, when you realize that it's God, God's heart revealed to you, and He's going to reveal His will. He's also going to reveal things perhaps in your character. He's going to reveal things to you to communicate with you. And this word, since it's the heart of God revealed, it's, it's not going to be exhausted. He has millions, more than millions of ways to communicate with you through this, what seemingly, it's just a small, he's got more thoughts for you than there is words in this book. I mean, it's really amazing. It is absolutely inspired. It's God-breathed. Philippians 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, if he upholds all things by the word of his power, and he works in you to do of his good pleasure, then what is our testimony to be when we receive the word of God? I do always those things that please him by his word. Because his word is in me, I shall do always those things which please him. In Psalm 119, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I do always those things that please him. And if I always do those things that please him, I will never, by that word, do anything that does not please him. That is our privilege. That is our inheritance. That is our right as being children of that word. So who's going to diminish the word of God and who's going to have no faith at all? Who's going to be unbelieving? Because in unbelief, we can't, we can't even entertain doubt. We can't even entertain unbelief for a moment at the risk of our own souls. Because that's everything to us. Let's go to Colossians 3.16. Colossians 3.16 I'm going to really need some water. This isn't going to work. Do I? Is my water there? Yeah, could you bring me that? <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a big jug of water. And um, I'm just going to do a plug right here. You need your water to stay hydrated. It's, um, it's the only way that you're going you're gonna to feel all right. <laughs> And drink a lot of it. Yes. So don't be ashamed to have a big jug. Be unashamed. <laughs> okay. Colossians 3.16. What are we to do? How are we to have this connection with that word? It sounds good. But so many people are tempted to doubt. Really? That's really what the word will do? Absolutely. It'll do everything in you that it says it will do. We'll look at that. 3.16 of Colossians, it says this. It says, let the word of Christ, what does it say in, in there? Dwell. dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And now, how are you going to sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord if you don't actually have the word of God in you? But the only way you're going to sing grace at all, the only way that you have grace at all is because of this word. Because he's revealed to you salvation. By faith are you saved. By grace are you saved through faith. But without faith in the word, which comes by the word, you have nothing. You're not able to do that. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly so that you can have a powerful experience. A living experience. Something beyond yourself. Because God isn't calling you to have an experience of yourself. He's calling you to a relationship with the Word. He's calling you to have a new experience, a creative experience, a powerful experience. And it says, when I get there, it says in 2.13 of 1 Thessalonians, for this cause I thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Now what does it mean to have it in truth? He explains, which effectually works also in you that believe. 
That word is not to be so detached from us that we're studying this thing as a history book as though it's just any old, old letter. It's not. It's living. It's living. Looking at the word, it effectually works in you that believe so that you can do all of God's good pleasure. Let's go to Psalm 33, verse 9. Psalm 33, verse 9. We're going to look a little bit more at the power of this word. Because in seeing the power of the word, we'll see the power of Christ. In seeing the power of Christ, we're going to see that he has everything to do with us. Everything. And I'll share that in a later meeting. Psalm 33, verse 9, speaking of the word, it says, For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, he commanded, and it stood fast. Now I want to ask you, if God commands you to do something, is, is that, if it says it stands fast, it, it's upheld, does that mean that if he commands you to do something, that you'll be upheld? Yes. Yeah? I mean, just think about it. So then, his commandments are powerful? His commandments are life? All right. His commandments to us are everything. But the commandments, detached from Christ, separated from Christ, have no power to uphold. They, they, they really can't do anything. They're, they're, all they can do is condemn you, to show you what you are not without the power of God working effectually in you. They show you how you cannot please God and that it is impossible at all to please God. Go to Psalm 148, verse 5. Psalm 148, verse 5. And it says, 148, verse 5. It says, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. So the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Yeah? It's creating the soul. The commandments of God are perfect. And then what does it say that we're to do then? We're to praise him. We're to be creatures that are praising our God. And to praise him, even in the midst of trial, shows that you have a faith and belief in what God is doing for you. You believe that God is able to uphold you. You believe that God is powerful and that He's going to keep you and He's going to do for you what He said He will do because His Word cannot fail. It will not fail and it will never fail you. So then where is our trust? Where is our confidence? Is it in the fact that we are humans? It's, we, are, we are sons and daughters of the living God if we believe this word. Let's go to 1 John. Christian? Yes. I, uh, I heard, just I heard one, maybe, what's that? I heard one STA pastor say that some of the commandments that God gave to the Jews were not found in the Old Testament. Yeah. And so they were right, yeah, ten suggestions. Well, yeah, and if we destroy the... <clears throat> if we destroy the Word of God in any way, and a lot of people today are destroying this Word, right? And so, if you destroy the Word, if you destroy the framework of believing actually what it says, you're never going to rise above anything above that. You're not actually going to have a greater experience. Okay, so, but, let's, but as far as questions and comments, we'll, we'll, leave them till, we'll leave them to after if there's some time. Okay, let's go to, where did I say we were going to go? What's that? First, first uh, no, not First John. Let's go to the Book of John. I said First John. I meant John. Although First John has a lot of good stuff too. Now, it says speaking of that word in verse twelve. What, one, John chapter one, verse twelve. I said First John. I meant John one. I reversed it. <laughs> okay. So, John chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 12. Speaking of those who receive the word, because not all are receiving the word, 
It says, but as many as received him, that is the word of God, that is Christ, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Even them that believe on the word. When you believe in the word, that'll transform you. That'll give you a new experience. That'll give you a living experience with God. You'll be able to see His working in your life because you're not in darkness because you're in the Word. You're abiding in the Word and the Word is abiding in you. That's what the wise virgins do. They lay up oil in their lamps so that they don't run out of light. It's not just ink on a page. It's a, it's a living, shining Word. Why though? Because this Word is connected with that Word. You can't disconnect it. You can but if you do, then you won't find anything happen at all for you and you'll be frustrated by your experience and you'll say, your testimony rather than I do always those things that please him, it's going to be like, we're only human. We're going to keep falling. We're going to continue in sin until Christ comes. Rather than being saved from your sins, you're going to continue in your sins. But you have no power to do anything else. So it's to be expected. So doubt is a most pernicious sin because through it, every other sin comes. And the only way we can have faith is by Christ. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, we don't see Christ, but we do see this Bible. The Bible is good but it should lead us to something a little more than what a lot of people's confessions are right now. Hebrews 11, verse 3, actually. It says this. It says that through faith, which comes by the Word, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So the things which are seen, everything that we're seeing, everything that the eye looks upon, we're seen, we're made by the things which do not appear. So you can't see the Word. You never actually were there to see the creation. But faith itself requires of us to believe that God did it. And it requires of us to believe that God has power. And that is necessarily intrinsic to our experience because if by faith we understand that He created things and His power is not limited and we see that connection to our own souls as our Creator, we're going to see the sanctifying power of the Word. But read verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So, it's not possible to please God without faith. Is it? It's not even possible to have God in you without faith. It's not possible to walk with God without faith. It's not possible for you to have the power of God without faith. You can't see the righteousness of God, so you're not being changed. Well, I think that without faith, you have absolutely nothing at all. You can't actually obey God. You can't do anything. And of course, your testimony is numbered with the unbelievers. It's because you don't actually have something. Everybody says, just believe. Well, that's great. But what does belief take in? Belief takes in so much more than what people are saying. But it's powerful. It is powerful. Let's go to John 7, verse 63. Without faith it's impossible to please Him, but by faith I do always those things that please Him. John 7, verse 63. Did I say 63? Yeah, I know there's no 63. So I'm just trying to think of what this is. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, brother. <laughs> All right. John 6. John, yeah, okay, good. John 6, 63. Jadiel. That's a, that's a blessing. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay, John 6, 63. Speaking of the Word, and what the Word is to us. It says, 
It is the spirit that quickens, it is life giving. The flesh, it profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So the words are spirit and they are life. The creative words of God, they are spirit. And without that, there's no spirit. And we want the spirit in our lives because it's by the spirit that we are changed. It's by that, the spirit of the word that we are changed and by that we have life. Now, it says that it's quickening, but the flesh profits nothing. So my question is, why are so many people living by the flesh? Why are they talking about their flesh as though their flesh could do anything for them? Because our flesh profits nothing. It can't do anything for us. can do no good thing. In my flesh dwells no good thing. That's what the apostle said. And if the apostle said it, I believe it. So why would I put confidence in it? So I think our focus needs to be on Christ. Our focus needs to be on the power which God will give to us. And the thing that he promises to us is true. Let's go to 2 Corinthians verse 1. 2 Corinthians, verse 1, that word is everything. Is it chapter 1? Yeah, first, uh, second, second Corinthians, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 20. All right, is everyone there? Yeah, amen. Right, and it says, speaking of Christ, for all the promises of God in Him are yes, and they are in Him, amen. That, that is, they are truth. They are, they are verily sure to you. They are assured to you unto God by us. By us. Why by us? Because by us needs to be exercised the faith which God has already given to us in His Word. He's given the word, but now it's up to us to exercise the faith which he has given to us. And we can choose either to choose to doubt and to let go of the word. We can choose to hold on, take hold of faith, and we will find that the promises of God are all true. How many times I've gone to God and I've said, you said this in your word, and I've held on to it, and I've seen him do some amazing things because I believed in his word. And that's especially true when, we, when David and I are traveling together. We're traveling, we're going from place to place, to place to place. Sometimes you don't know where your money is coming from. Sometimes you don't know what's going to happen if you're going to have shelter. You just don't know the circumstances of any place that you go. It can vary depending on what you're doing and the circumstances of what you're doing. The field of work that we are doing can be very broad at times because we're doing many different things. So that requires of you faith to believe that God is going to provide for you. That if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. All things that you need, that is the kingdom of God. That is his righteousness. That is everything. And that means that if we have his righteousness, it's because it's being revealed. And if we have his righteousness being revealed, it's because we have the gospel. Because we believe. So in him, in Christ, all the promises of God are made sure to us. They are founded. They are fixed. And that is an eternal fact that can never be broken. Let's look at Abraham. Let's go to Romans 4.17 and look at how good the promise was to him. Now, my words, they are spirit and they are life. They are life-giving promises. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to read verse 17. This talks a little bit about somebody who was the father of the faith. Somebody who believed God's word. And we're going to see exactly what happened when he believed God's word. It says in verse 17, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead. And calls those things which are not as though they were. So what, what does God do? He calls something as though, even though it's not, he calls it as though it were. He calls us sons and daughters, and it doesn't matter what we look like in the flesh. We might not look like all the other worlds that are being upheld by the word of his power, that are being upheld in righteousness. Nevertheless, even though we don't look like it, even though we don't, it doesn't appear to us, we believe it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse 1. It's the thing not seen, not the thing that is seen. 
So we need to believe the God who is not seen, the invisible God, and we also need to believe in Christ. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Remember, he was going away. And the reason is because he wants to inspire us to faith. So he called Abraham a father of many nations, but he wasn't a father at all. Abraham was not a father at all when he received this promise. And he said, could you see how Abraham could have doubted? You know, sure, I'm, <laughs> I'm a father of many nations. Either this God has a sense of humor or this God is always speaking the truth and it has power to do exactly what it says. And when he says that you're a child of God, believe it. Believe it. It says that he quickens by, he quickens the dead, he calls those things which be not as though they were. He calls you to be spirit and life. He calls you to be a blessing. He calls you to be a living epistle to reveal that word, to reveal that gospel. And look in verse 18. Here's our example. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. According to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. And verse 19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. He didn't consider what he could see when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he believed that God, who quickens the dead, God who speaks life, God who keeps his word and his promises, could do for him exactly what he said. He didn't understand how, but it was the power of the word which would quicken his dead body and it would also quicken Sarah's womb. That is the promises of God at work. God is not limited by circumstances. He is not limited by anything that we see around us. He's not limited by what we, what we can see. Because God has made all things by his word, that means that all things can be assured to us. He will move the mountains, he will part the seas, and he'll work for us and do for us exceedingly above all that we think or all that we ask because he is able to, because he doesn't have to be confined to laws. He himself makes the laws and he causes them to do exactly what he pleases. So he is able to do that. Now we just have just a few verses left and then we'll be finished looking at this faith. Let's go to Matthew 8. We're going to see a story about this faith. And believe that it should inspire us all to faith. Matthew 8. And we'll start at verse 7 and we'll read to verse 10. And it says, Jesus said to him, oh, actually, let's, let's go to verse 6 just to get the context. So it's saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick with the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and I will heal him. So, so Christ, the word is saying, I'll go and I'll, I'll heal him. But look at the faith of this, this person. It's the centurion. Verse 8, it says, And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man also under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goes, and to another come, and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Truly I say to you, that I have not found so great faith in all of Israel. He saw the one in whom is all power, he saw the one who wasn't limited to circumstances. He saw that the word alone could do what it said it will do. He said, you don't need to come. You don't need to be here in person. You don't need to be here in flesh. I believe that without seeing that you can do it. So please just speak the word and let your ministry go on. You have a lot to do as the word of God so that you can bring people into salvation. And he says, I have not seen this kind of faith in amongst all of these people who profess to believe in my coming. What about us? We believe that he's coming. And when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He will find faith on the earth. 
but he'll find it because he's given it to us as a gift. Let's go. Let's go to Psalm 27, verse 8. Now, I, I like how the Roman centurion said something. He said, I command, I say go, and then he goes. I say do this, and he does it. So he knows what it means to have something about the power of the word. And he believes that the word is found, that power that God gives is found in that word. That word is Christ. And Psalm 27, verse 8. We've got about three verses left. Psalm 27, verse 8. Yeah. And it says, notice that what's, what's being said here. It says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, Lord, I will seek your face. Your face I will seek. Why? That's the response to the word of God. <laughs> that is belief. He says, he gives a command, and then I become that thing which he commanded. He says, seek my face. I seek your face. He says, stand and I will stand. He says, go and I will go. And who is going to undo what he says? That's powerful. That's powerful. When we realize that God is speaking to us and that we're to reflect the very thing that he's speaking into us. He's speaking this life. He's speaking this blessing into us. And as we receive the Spirit, we become changed. Yeah, I'll seek your face. But that's the only way we can seek his face. My heart said this to you. My heart said this to you. Let's go to Romans chapter 10 one last time. My heart said this to you. And so when giving this discourse on faith, Paul talks about all of this. And he talks about the heart and what what's necessary for the heart. And it's clear that the heart was affected by the word when he said, seek my face. And it says in verse 6, it says, But the righteousness which is of faith, saith on this wise, say not in your heart who shall descend into heaven or who shall descend into the deep. And verse 8, it says the following. But what does it say? The word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word which we preach. And in verse 9, And if you shall confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But the only way you're going to believe in your heart and say in your heart, your face will I seek, is if you get into the Word and actually see what it actually says. This gives us our charge and this gives us our power to keep that charge. His biddings are enablings. So that we're not alone when we see His Word. We're not alone. And going, the last few, few verses, go to Psalm chapter 40. Psalm chapter 40, verse 7. I love this. It says the following, Psalm 40, verse 7, it says, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. Verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Thy words are within my heart. It says, I come in the volume of what book? The volume of the book is the scripture. To do your will. His will is revealed in this word, and this word is to be manifesting Christ to us. So what book is it? It is Scripture. And the Scripture does what? It testifies of Christ. It reveals Christ. That's the only purpose for the Scripture. Because without Christ, we're not going to have anything. So let's look at the, the power. I believe that this, this word right here, and even our own selves, we're going to be just like this word. We're going to be like ink on a page. And people that see us, we're going to be known and read of all men. And when we're known and read of all men, that's going to, that's going to bring people to the gospel. It's going to bring people to Christ. 
What's that? It reveals us to Christ in doing that. It reveals us to God. It reveals us to Christ, and in doing so, it reveals us to God. God is the only thing that reveals us finally. Mm -hmm. The revelation of Christ. Right. It's, it comes to us, and then it returns. And that's when, when all those... Who, it says He commanded, and they were created. But it says, let all of those praise them. Well, that's what we're supposed to do too when He commands. We're supposed to be to the praise and glory of God. We're to praise God. And everybody's going to see this faith. Everybody's going to see something different. They're going to see power in our lives. And they're going to see that, wow, the promises of God are truly working in Him. The power of God is working in Him unto salvation. They don't need to say if they will believe in the God who is impartial and is... is he gives liberally to all that call upon Him and all who believe on His name. That we have nothing special that they can't have. What we have is what they can have. And if they will but see that, they will see that they can have power. They can have a new experience. And that the promises of God are yes. They are amen in Him by us. So we become a promise to them that God can do for us what He's what He will do for them. What he, he will do for them, He has done already in us. Go to John 17, verse 17 and 19. And we'll see that this Word itself receives power by Christ. John 17, verse 17 to 19. And we'll see He Himself, the Word, understands very clearly, because all understanding comes by Him, that this word is only good through him. Revelation, or John 17, verse 17 to 19. And it says this, He prays to His Father and says, Sanctify them, that is, make them holy through your truth. Your word is truth. So the Bible. As you have sent me into the world, even so I send them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So what has he done? He has literally just empowered the Word. So if we will see this as Christ to us, if we see that connection, then this Word will have sanctifying a holy influence on us, a life-changing influence on us, and we will have communion with God. Our fellowship will truly be with the Father and the Son, and we will be in His presence. And we will be in His presence soon, physically, but by faith now, it starts today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6. This word, this precious word, it's everything to us. And Satan, trying to hide the gospel, tries to snuff out everything. But the gospel is greater than Satan, overcomes Satan, has cast out Satan, and this is the gospel. Verse 6, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. That is where the transformation takes place. In the face of Jesus Christ. That is where the true knowledge of God comes. That is where the righteousness of God is revealed. That is where the power of God is. That is where the Spirit comes from. And that is where the life comes from. That is where our experience and our enabling goes. And when He says go, we will go. We will go. Verse, go to verse 5, 17. What are we to be then? He said to Abraham, you are father of many nations. What are we to be? 5.17 It says, All things were made by the word. And it says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that is the word. If any man be in the word, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. And now we don't see all things becoming new. But yet we believe by faith that this promise is to us and it's true and that God will do according to His own pleasure. And it is His pleasure, little children, to give you the kingdom. 
if you believe, it is His pleasure to give you His promises. And let's see the sum of the matter. Revelation 22, verse 5. Revelation oh, 21, verse 5. Revelation 21, verse 5. And He'll give us the kingdom at last. If we will be faithful unto the end, if we will endure unto the end, the promise is made sure to us already in Christ, as though it were already finished. Let's start at verse 4. It says, And God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. Let's just, let's just do this. Let's, let's enter into the Word. There shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain at all for the former things have passed away. It's become real to us. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I made all things. I make all things new. Believe it because I have said it. Are you a new creation in Christ? We gotta be. We gotta take hold of faith. Are we a new creation in Christ? Yeah. Everybody's silent. The word needs to be in the heart, the mouth. With the mouth, we make confession unto salvation. We need to say Amen. amen. The promises of God are Amen. They are life-giving. They are quickening. They are powerful, and that is to be our confession. That God's word has been true to us, and we will confess it. We will believe it, and that it will change us we will have Christ dwelling in us and Christ will be seen on our faces. We will reveal the glory of God and the earth will be lightened with His glory. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Rob. Can I make a comment that Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 11, 3, the faith chapter, uh -huh. alluded to that. Right. I just had, I just had something written here I thought it would be kind of humorous in a way. What's that? came first, the chicken or the egg. And when you see the egg, you, you understand something that's to come, right? You see that the, the chicken will come out of the egg. And so you know what? I think that's, that's how we need to look at the Word. He's planted the seed in maybe corruptible soil, but it's an incorruptible seed. So if He plants that seed of His Word like that, then we're going to be changed. And we're going to... So let's expect something better from God because He's promised so much better. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we thank You, thank You, thank You, and we praise You that we can be new creatures in Christ, Your Word. Father, that You have revealed Your glory in Your Word, You've revealed Your Gospel in Your Word, and Father, You're calling us to believe. And that belief takes in so much. Thank you, Father, that your righteousness is revealed even at this moment. And Father, that by that word we are not what we were before. Old things are passed away. All things by that word have become new. And that word is, is really your son. He is at your right hand. Your word is good as though it were already done. And you've spoken it to us as though it were already finished. So Father, because your word is so firm, I pray that each one of us we'll find that eternal fixture for our faith. That we'll be eternally founded on that word, Father, that we will, we will see that what you've done in your word is going to be abundant in fruitfulness. And Father, that your word is not going to return to you void, but your word is going to return with us. And Father, we will praise you because you've commanded and we were created. And Father, we were created by your word and for your word. And by your word, he will present us before you, faultless before your throne. So we thank you, Father, for your rich, exceedingly great and precious promises, which are true to us. We claim them. Give us the faith, Father. We believe, help our unbelief, because you've promised it. And Father, it's impossible for you to lie. Let the light shine, just as you commanded it to shine out of the darkness, into our hearts. That word which makes confession unto salvation, 
To your honor and glory we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.